Uh, I'm Lawrence Samuels. I, I wrote the book, Killing History, the False Left-Right Political Spectrum, and a few more lines after that. Um, I want to talk about how I, I came to that point of writing this book. I wasn't planning on writing this book. It was actually in a chapter in another book, one I haven't published yet. It's called Government, a State of Deception. And um, it was just a little, kind of be a little thing, just, you know, getting a little bit into political spectrum, how it probably is off a little bit, something's, you know, wrong with it, because I've noticed that for years. In fact, I wrote um, probably 20 pages on the political spectrum when I was in college, and I was using some of that, and of course it was crap. <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't find a lot of material at the college library. And, um, you know, I thought I'd use some of that. And what happened is I found a, a, a sabotage in history. And, and it really bothered me. Um, online, you'll see um, uh, copies of the political and social doctrine of fascism. Often they just say doctrine of fascism. The one from uh, 33, the one that was translated from the 32 Italian version. And they almost all of them say uh, uh, that fascism is on the right, or Mussolini supposedly says fascism on the right. But then I've, I was reading a book by Hoover, President Hoover in 34, and he had uh, uh, some sections from that doctrine of fascism, and it didn't connect with what was on the internet. And so I began to find publications written in the 30s that actually took the doctrine of fascism, because it's only 26 pages long, and it said something different than what's on the internet. And so I had to buy it. It's a collection from Ireland. It's somewhat rare, and this is the political and social doctrine of fascism authorized edition by a lady who's with the Times of London. And in that, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm opening it up and saying, well, what's true? What's true? Which, which, which way, you know? So on page 20, it said, and you can feel this, this is, you know, a lead, lead uh, printed uh, type, you know, it's not, not uh, been copied at the local uh, coffee, copy shop. And it says, a century of authority, a century of the left, and left is capitalized, a century of fascism. So Mussolini is saying that fascism, Italian fascism, is on the left. But you go online, it's going to say on the right, or tendency to the right, almost everywhere. Or, in some cases, instead of left, it'll say dot, dot, dot. So I'm saying, well, if they're going to lie about that, that's a big lie. Because the political spectrum is sort of based on it, that, you know, Mussolini is a right-wing nationalist, you know, but it turns out he's a left-wing communist. So, so I'm saying, well, well, maybe, you know, something's wrong with this. Maybe something's wrong. So I start studying Mussolini. Well, good God, he was a hardcore socialist running around with Lenin and Trotsky in, in Switzerland. And there's a lot of quotes he says, you know, I'm a communist, I'm a communist. I have a little medallion, the medallion with, uh, with uh, uh, car marks on it. We ca I carry it everywhere. <laughs> uh, depends what time period you have to talk about. But no, he did not really like the, the, the wealthy people. When he was a, um, he didn't start, okay. He was a Marxist probably, probably almost from birth because bedtime stories was Das Kopf the Tau from Mark, Karl Marx. His father was reading him Marx when he was a young kid. So, you know, he was a revolutionary, social, a revolutionary syndicist. Uh, some people call him an anarcho syndicist. Uh, uh, he's called himself a communist uh, when he was in charge of, of uh, the Italian Socialist Party. He considered himself a Bolshevik and he would kick out moderates. <laughs> but about 19, not, uh, 1915, he started up the fascist revolutionary party. 1915, according to this, he talks about it. I, I started the fascist revolutionary party. Well, sounds a little commie to me, but okay. Anyway, so, so here he's, he's still sort of a Marxist. In 1919, uh, 1917, he starts the fascist party. 1915, he starts the fascist party. 
But you find out in 1917, he supported Lenin and the communist revolution. In fact, he said Lenin wasn't socialist enough. He hadn't really created a dictatorship of the proletariat. He hasn't really created a socialist party the way Marx wanted it to be. He was criticizing. He loved Lenin, but he was still criticizing. 1919, he runs as a member uh, of the fascist revolutionary party, running for an elected position. His campaign slogan was, I'm the Lenin of Italy. I'm the Lenin of Italy. He was trying to out-socialist the socialists, according to a couple of historians. And so, wait a minute, you're a fascist and a Marxist? So at least for six years, he was a fascist and Marxist. 1921, late 1921, he started to pull back. And probably was more of a closet Marxist. Uh, because um, he was having trouble with the Socialist Party of Italy, the Italian Socialist Party. They had actually kicked him out in, uh, in 1914 because he supported uh, World War I. He wanted Italy to get involved in World War I. And for some reason, historians say, oh, that's when he was no longer a socialist. No, he has quotes saying, you can kick me out of this party, but you can't kick my so socialism out of me. <laughs> and, and actually, when you, you, you get into it, Almost every other socialist and labor party wanted their country to get into the war. The German, the, the, the German socialists wanted to support the war, the Belgium, the French. I mean, oh, you know, everybody was becoming national socialist. And there's actually a quote from, uh, from Mussolini. It says, you know, we're all national socialists. Then the war came along. Then became national socialists. And that's fascism. <laughs> so, so, um, he did back off a little bit because what happened in Italy was the Marxists wanted a revolution like what happened in uh, Moscow. And they started to kick people out of their houses, kick people out of their farms, started to force people to, to join uh, unions, took over city halls and tried to, to uh, hurt uh, the middle class, anybody who was in business. You know, uh, uh, it, they had bombs going off. Uh, in theaters, in fact, there was one uh, bomb went off, and the uh, uh, the uh, the socialists were saying how great that was. They killed what what twenty people in it, and you say, oh, that's great. Let the bourgeoisie die off. <laughs> and so there was these squads, action squads, came up and started to react to this Marxist violence, and Mussolini started to move in that direction. He was doing what you call entryism. He was trying to take a small fascist group that was mostly based on Marxism and revolutionary syndicalism and kind of say, I'm taking over this other movement. But he wasn't really the cause of it. But he was willing to try to bring him in and eventually had to move in that direction because there was just so many socialists and Marxists everywhere that he just couldn't get anywhere. He was, for some reason, the Marxist associates just really hated Mussolini for some reason. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why. And so that's how he kind of got into power and changed his name from Fascist Revolutionary Party to the National uh, Fascist Party. Actually, during that convention in 21, late 21, he wanted to call it the uh, Fascist Labor Party. But he couldn't get these more conservative elements who were, you know, in reaction to the violence to agree with it. So his arrangement was, you make me the leader of the party, and I'll let you change the name to National Fascist Party. But think about 34 with Mussolini. 1934, he's bragging, I have nationalized, I put into the hands of the state, three-fourths of the Italian economy. Three-fourths. Uh, that, that's better than any country in the world except the Soviet Union. So he was overjoyed. If, if the word they used during this speech to the to his, uh, uh, the Italian assembly was, he was bragging because he really wanted the economy taken over completely by the government. And he couldn't do it before then. And now he did by 34. Some argue about, did he really have three fours? Maybe it was only a half or, you know, somewhere in between. But, uh, you know, this is, this is the kind of person we're talking about. You know, how can you be a, 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 you know, a conservative right winger if you support Marxism, <laughs> you support nationalization of the economy. So the whole, whole spectrum is just, just off. 
But the idea that, that, um, that they lied about what's in this book means there's a lot more myth-making out there. Uh, the, why do you make that the Bible? Why do you make that the thing that lies? To you? Because you, it's usually, if you go online, this is how they determine the political spectrum uh, of uh, around World War I time. Because Mussolini uh, was someone that had to dehumanize uh, because he attacked with Hitler uh, 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 Stalin, who he had a great admiration for, actually. He was really reluctant to join Hitler and, and attack them. He wanted, he had a treaty with him. He, he, in fact, Hitler was the first country, first Western country to recognize the Soviet Union. And that was 1924. And he was pushing that since 23 to 22. Now, if you're really anti-communist, why would you <laughs> recognize the Soviet Union? And then a few years later, you had a big treaty with them where they got a lot of oil from Russia, and they gave them return technology, uh, uh, airplanes, ships, all this stuff that some people believe that, that if this trade hadn't happened, that the Soviet Union could not have defeated uh, Nazi Germany because they, ju they just nobody else wanted to trade with them. They didn't trust the Soviet Union, but Mussolini did. This one here, this is the uh, political and social doctrine of fascism. Okay. Look at page 20, and you'll see uh, near the top the uh, historical yeah, sabotage. Yes, 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 yes. So, so yeah. Well, I mean, he talks about other things in the book, too. He's a collectivist. He doesn't like classical liberalism. He actually, in the 35 edition, he talks about how bad classical liberals are. He may be one of the first persons to have recognized that there is being a big shift. He could work with the current modern liberals, but he did not want anything to do with the classical liberals. And he talks about that in 1935. Uh, one. It's not, I don't think it's in this one. Um, so anyway, this spectrum here, I have two, two charts, and this is where the confusion is. Let's see, go over here. <laughs> uh, this is according to the French Revolution. So I had to go back to the French Revolution. And it was the classical liberals, Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, who were involved in the French Revolution. Even Thomas Jefferson. Now, he was gone by the time it happened, but he wrote The Rights of Man with La Lafayette. Uh, sorry, no, 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 Thomas Jefferson. No, this is another one. This is the one that they, there's one they passed. It's called The uh, Rights of Man and Citizens or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And that was La Lafayette, General Lafayette, and Jefferson wrote it, and just as he left, the French Revolution happened. And they passed that in the assembly with the classical liberals who sat on the left side. And, and, that, you know, and on the right side was the authoritarians. I prefer this one. I, I'll show you the chart B. Chart B is the same thing, except it's been reversed. Well, I'll show it to you in a minute. Anyway, so you can see down here, the extreme left, open, individual liberty, no government, anarchy, of course. Libertarianism, classical liberal, I call this the free left. Conservatism, modern liberalism, social democracy, Hitler was a social democrat for a while. Uh, fascism, national socialism, and communism. Again, the right closed. There's two ways you could do it to get rid of left and right. Call this closed, call this open. Total government. And, and, you know, this is according to the French Revolution. Now, what happened was, there's a philosophy out there that believes in, I call it, a theocracy. They'll steal anything, anytime. Money, ideas, words. Doesn't matter what it is. Oh, okay. So, here is chart D. And really, nothing has really changed on it. Except now, the right includes anarchy, libertarian, classical liberals, and the left includes, you know, fascism and communism. And the reason, this is the alternative one, about the 1850s, oh, 60s, the communists came along and started saying, uh, we want to be the, on the left, even though really they should be on the right. They're authoritarian. They're almost like the old monarchists, but with ideology. Uh, and so they said... We're on the left. Anybody who disagrees with us is on the right. And that's still that way. Communists believe Obama is a right winger. He believes Elizabeth Warren is, is a right winger. Everybody's a right winger except 
the radical Marxist. And so, and again, it says the result from the social Marxist is stealing the left wing designation from the classical liberals. I have a historian, major historian, that says that. You know, fully documented in my book on chapter one. And so this is what makes it confusing. Which one are we going to go by? The original one or what the ones the Marxists said we should believe in? You know, maybe again we should just say open and closed instead of left and right. So, uh, and the French Revolution was very interesting when you get into it. Before they uh, stormed the Bastille, they stormed some tax booths in Paris. When you go into Paris, you had to pay a tax every time you came in. I think it was in instead of out. And they hated it. So they tore down these things, then stormed the, uh, the, uh, the old prison uh, castle. Uh, they did a lot of amazing things. They, they lowered taxes when they got in control, um, uh, gave rights to, to colored people, uh, emancip emancipated the Jews, gave them rights. This is the classical liberal uh, people who were in charge of the French Revolution for about three years. There's two stages. The first stage, the liberals were in charge. And, and uh, you know, there were what you think. They even had uh, uh, gun rights, were supposed to be uh, trying to do gun rights, and very good gun rights. Because, you know, again, Jefferson was involved in this, but they, they didn't get into the final rights of man, the French rights of man. <laughs> well, that's a little later. <laughs> but uh, but uh, lower taxes, allowed, uh, tried to get rid of uh, every bit of, of, of servitudism, tried to let the peasants own their own land. I mean, on and on and on, just great stuff. But then all of a sudden, about three years after the revolution, uh, the social revolutionaries came into play, Robespierre and his people. And they had mobs, and they started to demand free education, free this, free that. And, uh, and eventually they put the the classical liberals on trial, 22 French assemblymen, uh, 23 actually, because one was Thomas Paine. He was in the free market uh, 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 left, or the bourgeoisie left, or the free left, whatever you want to call it, and he was actually scheduled to be guillotined, but he escaped. But two, 22 did not, and they uh, were condemned as counter-revolutionaries because they didn't want to go over to the social part of the revolution, plus they a lot of them didn't want to have the king beheaded, um, especially Thomas Paine. He said that was, he said that was revenge killing. Uh, anyway, so it took 30, 30, 36 minutes to chop off 22 heads. And that was the end of the real French Revolution. Now you're getting into guillotines every day, 16,000 death uh, um, uh, condemnations, basically. Uh, the reason they say they put that in there because they're not sure if all those 16,000 were killed. Some might have escaped or running. And so it wasn't, they weren't just going after aristocrats. They're going after uh, uh, um, ladies of the night. They're going after their own kind. The revolution was eating its own, basically. And eventually you probably know that, that Robespierre got what he deserved. He was guillotined. After guillotining some of the people on his public safety committee, <laughs> Nobody was safe. I'm sure you heard that story. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Rose Pierre goes in front of, of the most uh, uh, important elite of France and says to him, I know more of you are counter-revolutionaries. Well, tomorrow I'll name them, which means that they'll be guillotine tomorrow. Well, they all grabbed him and shot him, and <laughs> he didn't die the next day to guillotine them. That was pretty well the end of, the, of, of that. But there's, uh, but, you know, you know, where are the classical liberals who are on uh, the, 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 the left side, traditionally, and the, and the authoritarians are on the right, which, which means, uh, and, I, mean, I like chart A, which means that Hitler and Stalin, all those people, they're authoritarian, they have to be on the right. You know, I mean, it makes no sense. How can you put an authoritarian on the left and authoritarian on the right? Like I said, if you're going to do that, then what do you have in the middle? Half authoritarian, his kind of system, half authoritarian, his system. I mean, who wants to be known as half fascist, half communist? Nobody thinks that. <laughs> but that's what the old political, the, the old system people going on say, you know? I mean, you, you just can't have fascism one and communism on the other. They're so close. Fascism actually came out of Marxism. You've got a lot of historians that say that. And... Uh, 
And just the fact that, that Mussolini was a Marxist fascist for six years, avowed, right there you have evidence. But, you know, there's a lot of good historians. Sternhill, A.J. Uh, Greger from uh, UC Berkeley, there's tons of them that say it came out of there. It's just a revision of it, a variant of it. You know, it, it's, you know it's so close. And I assume the, the reason the Marxists are so hot on trying to make Mussolini some right-wing reactionary is because they know that he was a commie. <laughs> he was a communist, a Marxist. In fact, some scholars have called uh, Mussolini the greatest uh, Marxist theoretician of the 20th century. He has at least two editions of his collective works. One is 36 volumes, and one is 44 volumes. Most of it's never been translated into English. If it's embarrassing, it's not been translated. There's a, a speech by Hitler when he talks about how great social justice is. You can't have a healthy state without social justice, internal social justice. That only came out translated recently, only about four or five years ago. You couldn't find it. I had a hard time finding it. It's in footnotes. It's called, Why Are We, uh, why are we Anti-Semites? And this is where he talks why about, are why are we anti-Semites? And he's talking about, you know, we're socialists. You know, how, you know, if you're socialist, how can you not be an anti-Semite? And that's another thing I went into. We find, you, if you look back, look at all the early socialists, they're all anti-Semites. Karl Marx hated Jews. Uh, you should see some of the words he used about, to, about Jews. I can't even pronounce that word, the N-word. He was a little bit Jewish, and he was an atheist. He's what you would call an anti-Jew Jew. And, uh, but he hated them, called, you know, said, uh, they're, you know, all the other greedy, greedy bastards. And he, you know, he would call other Jews uh, the N-word Jew <laughs> and then describe the hair as kinky. I mean, he was probably one of the first persons ever born. He was, you know, I mean, he was racist, anti-Semitic, uh, homophobic. Uh, I mean, you name war, a warmonger. Every, every, every war there was ever uh, during his time period, he supported I mean, it was just horrible how he treated his own people. If someone did better in his communist cells than him, he would attack him. And, his, and, and if he had a wife, he'd attack her and say, oh, she has syph syphilis. He has syphilis. You know I, mean? I mean, it's just a horrible person. But when you look at Marx and you look at Hitler, they're almost the same. In fact, I have an article coming out that uh, says that, that Hitler was the son of Karl Marx because Marx was a national socialist German. In fact, there's one quote there where he talks about, we got to go to war with uh, Russia uh, for, the, for, the, for the honor and interest of Germany. That sounds pretty nationalistic. <laughs> so, you know, there's all these myths. I can't get into all of them because, you know, I mean, my book's what, over, what, 500 pages and 1,500 footnotes. One editor said, actually, there's 19, because I kind of quit for a while, and then I got back to it again. I can, I'm really, I'm finding more stuff. I can make this double the size with good footnotes. I mean, just the other day, I found a quote I don't have in the book. I thought, I thought I'd gone through a lot of these speeches of Hitler, but a lot of them are still not, some are not translated and are not known. But the other day, I found one from 1941, and Hitler said, I am a fanatic socialist. And it's a speech uh, commemorating the 21st, 21st anniversary of the National Socialist Party of Germany. And, uh, and you know, and, and, you know, I keep finding them over and over again. If I, if, if I you know, keep searching for these rather unknown speeches, which they don't want, some people don't want to publish <laughs> or translate, there's, I'm sure there's more out there, quite a bit out there. A lot of it's anti-capitalist ra rantings. Go ahead. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Now, Conrad Haydn. Now, Conrad Haydn was a historian. His first one did a biography of Hitler. He lived in Munich. He lived around Hitler. He said that the, the, most companies hated Hitler. And there's very few industrialists that supported him. In fact, there's a lot of cases that they, if the company found out you were supporting Hitler, you got fired. He said, he, yeah, there's a line in there where he says, it wasn't for our anti-Semitism we have nothing to, to compete with, with Marxism. So, so if we didn't have this anti-Jew attitude in our philosophy, there's nothing to compete with Marx because we're almost alike. Well, I don't think he knew at the time. 
He didn't under, remember Marx, uh, Hitler was a communist for a while, 1919. He was, uh, first he actually, he was elected leader from his barracks to the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany. It was kind of a break off. And he worked with them. Then the Marxists came in and actually uh, took over Bavaria without a consensus of all these other parties. They just kind of kicked them out. You know, typical of Marx, Marxist. And he threw his hat in the ring when that happened and uh, won an elected position from his barracks to the German party that was running the uh, Soviet Bavarian Republic. And he didn't uh, leave his position. And they were doing horrible things. They were, they were taking hostages and shooting them. Uh, they were uh, kicking people out of their houses, taking food from people. Lenin was calling them up and kept saying to him, you got to nationalize the banks. you got to nationalize the banks. <laughs> Lenin, a lot of people think Lenin actually got the German party to do it because he had an army. This is the Russian-Poland war. He had an army coming from Moscow and it was going, invaded Ukraine, invaded Poland, and it was at the doorstep of Warsaw in, in 1919. And he not even wanted to go to Germany. He made, he made it plain. We're going to have revolution in Germany. And his army, and he wanted to have German communist, con, well, communist controlled areas in Germany. They took over Hungary for a while, took over Bavaria. They tried to have a revolution in Berlin. I mean, you know, this army was coming in, but it was stopped by the Polish army in war, in, around Warsaw. So this is the reason. But, but Hitler did not uh, resign when all these things were happening. You know, you know, getting really violent. And finally, the German army came in and, and kicked out supposedly 20,000 Red Guard Bavarians. The German army had somewhere around maybe 40, 30 to 40,000. Big street battles. They're not sure how many people died, maybe 600, a couple of thousand. A lot of people got shot afterwards. And what happened to him was Eriks did not put up a fight. The, the, the German Republic troops came in. I think one shot came from his barracks. But anyway, they were all in turn, all arrested. And they asked, they asked Hitler, they asked Hitler, and this is with this Conrad Haydn, who was in the area at the time. And they asked him, are you a communist? Because he was an elected leader, <laughs> uh, low level, from his barracks. And he said, no, I'm a social democrat. Now, if he said yes, he probably would have been shot uh, or in prison or sent back to Austria. So there's a reason why he would have said that. Well, okay, the trouble is you have, I, I have chart A and chart B, and if we had gone to the original one, we would have immediately known that Karl Marx would have been a right-winger because he is authoritarian. We know Pol Pot was a, a, a right-winger, and it wouldn't have this conflict. But again, they stole, they, they changed it because, okay, nobody wanted to be known as on the right with the aristocrats because they're so well-hated. And so they, you know, anybody, anybody of any knowledge would not want to be on the right. I think a lot of the aristocrats kind of object to it too. So they had no choice but to take the word left because right was such a bad word, even though they're really on the right. So if we just go by the original one, it makes sense. But, but it really doesn't matter because in, in some ways because everything here hasn't changed with the other chart. So the real thing to remember is you got to group the authoritarians with the authoritarians. The people who believe in, in tolerance and free market capitalism, you, you know, they group together. So <clears throat> you can't just put them on two things that are the exact the same as the exact opposites. That's the big lie. I mean, I mean who, couldn't, who could not agree that Stalin, who killed, what, 40 million people and... And I mean, and, and Hitler did what? I don't know, 11, 20 minutes. I mean, how, how could they be opposites? Now that we know that Mussolini was a Marxist, a hardcore Marxist for at least two decades and then kind of quiet down, now we know Hitler was well influenced by Marxism. If it wasn't for Marx, it would have been no Hitler or Mussolini. See, that's why they don't want this information known. Because, because the, the left, the status left, as I call them, try to, you know, versus the, the free left, uh, they are moving towards fascism. The Democrat Party is moving towards fascism. You can take almost anything economically, socioeconomics. Hitler had done it first. 
Uh, uh, Bernie talks about full employment uh, through public uh, works project. That's what Hitler did in the 30s. Uh, uh, Bar Bernie said when he was a, um, a mayor some time ago that private charity should be banned. Only government should be private. Well, that's what Hitler did in 33. He outlawed NGOs and created this uh, National Socialist People's Welfare uh, Organization because he wanted to do social engineering. He wanted to control who would get the welfare and who wouldn't, which they did eventually. Yeah, he sent uh, one to Italy, and, uh, to fascist Italy, one to the Soviet Union. They came back glowingly of their economic policies. In fact, their uh, Roosevelt uh, Inner Core got copies of a book about fascism written by the father of, of uh, the philosophical father of fascism. I forget what his name was. And he passed them out to everybody. <laughs> and, and of course, Mussolini knew this. When he was asked by a New York politician in, in 39, what is fascism? He said, it's like your New Deal. I mean, come on, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's there. You know, it's, so, so my chapter five kind of gets into slavery and the Democrats and Karl Marx, because I don't know if you know this, Karl Marx believed in black slavery. Yeah, it's in there. Actually, what I did is I did a list of what on my issues what the, you know, what the fascists believed, uh, what the National Socialists believed, and what the Stalin believed. They're almost always the same. And I have footnotes with it where quotes, I have quotes from either Stalin or Hitler, who's approving it. You know, that, you know, uh, like a lot of th people don't realize that Mussolini and Hitler were very pro-labor, extremely pro-labor. They were a labor organization. In fact, in the 20s, <coughs> Americans called Hitler's party the National Socialist Labor Party. And I kept running into it. I said, like is there, huh? Like a labor yeah. yeah, well, Mussolini was a labor organizer. He was very much a, uh, with labor. <laughs> and uh, people don't realize it. Everything that, that, that Lenin had done with labor, uh, Hitler and Mussolini did. And that is they uh, banned all independent labor unions. Lenin did that. And so did Hitler. And so did Mussolini. And then they created a government uh, a labor union, which they could control. And, uh, and they charge mandatory uh, labor fees. So they all, all did that. Strikes were, again, all out, uh, 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 outlawed. In fact, Lenin had that trouble when his economy failed in 21, after he nationalized everything. Um, he uh, had hundreds of strikes all across uh, Russia because the economy had collapsed. He had no longer had a worker state because there were no longer any workers. Most of them left for the country to find food. All the, almost all the mills, all the factories were closed down. You know, this caused a big problem with socialists and Marxists. Because in, in the end, when you've, the people own everything, which actually is the state, you're supposed to have this worker's paradise. And everybody is horrified that once you get to the final end, it all goes to hell. No utopia. This is what I think would change Hitler to a certain point. His his. His 25-point Nazi platform said that all corporations should be nationalized. Or, or sometimes you see the word trust, depends on the translation. And it was very, you know, uh, very leftist, or, or socialist, sorry. Yeah, there you are, right wing, socialist. Uh, but after that was said, and he pretty well wrote that uh, uh, platform, 21, all of a sudden now, you don't have any factories. You don't have any mills. Now, Hitler, even though he was a you know, hardcore socialist, he also hated England and France because of World War I and the Treaty of Versailles. Hated them. And so he's sitting there and saying, wait a minute, I want total socialism. I want the government to own everything, but then I have no factories. I have no mills. How can I build bombers? How can I build, build tanks? How can I, how can I have a war? Uh, sus, uh, a war uh, government <laughs> without some market economics. And he knew that. He knew that. You know, uh, you know after he wins the war, he could, he, you know, he could then just socialize everything then. But he had to win the war first. But he was, all the socialists were that. That's why a lot of socialists moved to national socialism to get away from Lenin's international socialism, which wasn't much of anything, really. Uh, 
almost every major uh, uh, socialist decided they wanted their socialism within a national framework, the culture, the language. And then they could say, well, that was Russia's uh, socialism. That was bad. But German socialism is good. French socialism is good. But Russia, well, that didn't work. <laughs> you can see how they're trying to get out of a hole by saying it's not just socialism, it's Belgium socialism. Therefore, the factories are not going to close and all the workers will lose their jobs. And so, you know, that's why the uh, Second International in 1916 um, uh, dissolved. And that was before, you know, the, uh, uh, the communism. But it was moving that direction before communism failed in Russia. Uh, the, the Second International was socialist parties and labor parties, and almost all of them joined their nation in World War I. And they became nationalistic. They realized nationalism was uh, the, move, the way to go with socialism. And, and, and yeah. Yeah, well, I agree. There's, that's why I wrote the book. I kept finding myth after myth after myth after I, I, you know, I found that this was such a big lie to actually take a book like this and change the wording in it. And so it's all over the place. Remember, after World War II, most people were just didn't want anything to do with World War II. Only the Marxists and the socialists wanted to write about World War II. And they put it in their narrative. It was a battle between capital, uh, late capitalism and this and that, uh, class struggle, on and on and on. They didn't want this information. And in fact, one historian, German historian, said he could not get anything about Mussolini's writings after World War uh, II. For decades and decades, Italy would not release Mussolini's uh, uh, collected works, almost anything uh, uh, from it. And so nobody knew his background or anything because they couldn't get anything on it. And, uh, and also, the same, uh, he wrote, I think, The Three Faces of Fascism. Um, he also said that up to the time of the Soviet Union falling, up to that time period, if you tr used Stalin and Hitler in the same sentence, trying to make some comparison, you would be laughed out of the history uh, community. So most historians are not going to risk their reputation to say that Hitler and Stalin had some connections, even if it's a little, you know. The, the communists controlled academia. It's amazing, at least in the history, history section. Well, yeah, in, in a sense. That's why I see all the time, Hit, you know, uh, when, when someone writes that Hitler was, very, was a socialist, they're constantly saying, oh, no, 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 he's not a socialist. No, no, he's not. <laughs> they got to keep that myth going. Because if you start to compare fascism with communism and, and all that, it'll destroy their whole system. Because now they're tainted. Now they're the racist. Now they're the fascist. And they can't have that. They, gotta, they always got to say the other side is it. Because actually, they are the, they're the, the fascist and racist and authoritarians and horrible people that don't have any, any tolerance for anything. So they, this is their, their screen. They have to have it. They die otherwise, and they know it. So uh, and they're going to defend it until they die, even though they don't have any, you know. And, and all these quotes are starting to come out about Hitler and Mussolini because of the Internet. A lot of books, a lot of this stuff I found on Google Books. You go in there, you know, on the Google Book of, of some book, and you have a little box there, and you can put words in, and you can scan the whole book and find things. It's a little difficult sometimes. But, you know, that's how you can find it. We have this information. It's not so... Uh, uh, unavailable now, and uh, and they're trying to trying to deal with it, and uh, well, they still really control the academic field. So all I can do is do my bit. That's what happened in Germany uh, when you got into the education of Germany. The the Germans thought that basically the Nazis thought that the state owned the child. There's some quotes I think from Goebbels. And Hitler basically saying, we own your child. And uh, people don't know this, uh, but um, once Hitler took over, um, they started to rewrite all the, all the manuals, basically, talk about racial uh, mathematics or uh, racial biology. They, they, were, they were, you know, indoctrinating the children 
And a lot of people at the time were worried because the kids were not learning. And also, the parents would not um, push them to learn because the kids had the right to turn their parents in to the Nazi party officials. They told them that if you, if you caught your uh, uh, parents saying things they shouldn't say, tell us and we'll take care of it. So they knew that uh, they could do anything, stay up later, do anything, because all they had to do is talk to the officials and their parents would be gone. Oh. Same thing in the Soviet Union. There's almost nothing different than that. I mean, there were actually block parties, chiefs, in Nazi Germany. Every block had a party chief and a couple people under them to keep an eye on the public. If you didn't sing how high enough, you might get in trouble. They would go to merchants and demand the surgeons keep records. Everybody came in and what they said, just like they did in Red China. And so the merchants had to keep track of their, of their clients and do a report and give it to the block captain. Same thing the, the, the communists did. There's, I mean, I mean you, know, you see these things. I mean, the Nazis told you what seeds to uh, use for growing, what fertilizer, if you can uh, sell your land or not. They controlled it. They had a lot of rules on it. They had price and wage controls. Near the end of the Nazi, uh, 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 before the war, uh, the people were starting to starve in Germany because of the price and wage controls. Even though they had billions of marks of subsidies, there's still not enough food. And there's a little, little line uh, I found from the 40s uh, uh, from Germany. It said, Hitler has no wife, the butcher has no meat, uh, the baker has no bread. This is how we live. And this is one reason uh, a lot of historians think World War II happened, because Hitler was afraid his own people were going to revolt against him. And he, when he went to these countries, he went there to plunder them. And boy, did they plunder them. An officer could go into a Polish store, take anything off the shelf, you know, after they invaded it, and it sent it off to his relatives back in Germany, and they could sell it on the secondary market. I mean, there was just coats coming, fur coats from Belgium. I mean, they're just looting the countries. And I even actually had a friend in my uh, office who was in uh, either, I think, Hungary, or I think it was uh, Austria, where one of the things he mentioned, he was a, ch a child when the Nazis came in, two things he mentioned. Uh, one was they came in and just looted the food, you know. And I've been in Germany; it doesn't you know? It's not rock that rocky. I mean, it looks like it could produce food. The other one is healthcare. The government, the, the Nazis came in, took over the healthcare system, and now there was lines of a hundred people trying to see a doctor before you could easily get in. There are books at the counter if you want to buy some. <laughs>